Small subwoofers like this have become quite popular over the last few years. Let's talk about why. We're gonna start right here with this specification. This is the FS, also known as the Free Rare Resonance or the Resonant Frequency. This specification is widely misunderstood. It's not a limit on how low the driver can play and it's not a guideline for port tuning. But as a general rule, a driver with a low FS will have an easier time hitting low notes. If you were to compare different size drivers that were the same brand and from the same product line for an apples to apples comparison, you'll see that the FS for a small driver is a lot higher than it is for a comparable larger driver. The FS is a function of two things, the CMS and the MMS. MMS is the moving mass, the parts that move like the cone, the voice coil, and the air that's right in front of the driver. The CMS is the compliance, a loose suspension is more compliant. So making the suspension looser will lower the FS. More on that in a bit. TLDR, holding everything constant, small drivers are gonna have a harder time hitting low notes. And while we're talking about frequency response, here's another specification that's widely misunderstood. A lot of manufacturers will give a frequency range for their subwoofers. That range is basically meaningless. You can mostly ignore it. How low your subwoofer actually plays is gonna be a function of how you tune the subwoofer enclosure. I'll show you that in just a little bit. If you take a look at the equation that you use to calculate the resonant frequency, you can see that the moving mass is on the bottom. That means as the moving mass goes up, the FS will go down. So a big heavy cone actually lowers the resonant frequency. The compliance is also on the bottom of that equation. As the subwoofer becomes more compliant, the FS also goes down. And that's just one problem with small drivers. The other problem is, well, they're small. Now in a perfect theoretical world, if you double your cone area, you're gonna gain three dB. All other things being equal, a larger subwoofer will play louder. You probably missed the most important part of that claim. The important part is all other things being equal. There's even a fancy Latin phrase for that, Certerus Paribus. More on that in a bit. As an example, take a look at these Rap Series subwoofers that Savard sent to me. A single 12 has more than triple the cone area of a six and a half. And hey, a big shout out to Savard for sending these things out. No strings attached. Most of the time when someone sends me a product, they want some specific review or test, or they want me to give a glowing review of their product Product and they want to approve the video before I upload it. Savard just sent these out and told me to have fun with them. <laughs> That's a bold move. Companies only do that when they trust their product. If small subwoofers struggle to get low and struggle to get loud, then why are they so popular right now? four-door pickup trucks. A lot of these trucks have enough clearance under the back seat for small front-firing subwoofers. You can get spacers to raise the seats and gain some extra clearance. These small subwoofers solve two huge problems with underseat enclosures. The first problem is when firing up, the subs have a tendency to rub against the underside of the back seat. On the flip side, quite literally, you can have down-firing subs underneath your seats. Those down-firing subs need a gap underneath the enclosure, that gap takes up airspace, and underneath that back seat, the airspace is already pretty scarce to begin with. If we could fire the subs forward, we can overcome these two problems. Plus, you can actually see the subs when the base drops, which is a big part of the fun. It's a lot more than just pickup trucks. Space is oftentimes the limiting factor in a car, and small subs just need less airspace. But we use small subwoofers because they overcome some other problem, so the challenge is now overcoming the problems caused by using a small subwoofer. The first thing you can do is throw a ton of power at it. Compare something like this Rap 6.5 to this Tang Band 6.5. The Tang Band has a power rating of something like 80 or 100 watts, but the Savard is rated for 250. These two subwoofers are completely different animals. The nominal size is the same, but everything else is different. It's not Certerus Paribus. Like anything else in life, there is of course a drawback to this. High power subwoofers typically need stiffer suspensions. Stiffer suspensions means there's gonna be a higher FS. So when Savard designed this sub, they had to figure out the best way to balance those trade-offs. Keep watching and we'll find out if they managed to pull that off. Another way to solve the small sub problem is to think outside of the box when it comes to box design. 
Let me open up WinISD and I'll show you what I mean. This right here is typically how I prefer to tune my enclosures. I shoot for a flat frequency response that extends as low as possible. But if you look a little closer at the plot, you'll see that it plays flat to about 48 hertz and then the bass drops off at a rapid rate. The F3 is 39 hertz and that's, well, terrible. But if you plug in Savard's recommended box size, you get something quite different. The idea when using these small subwoofers is to increase the enclosure size, which will give you a bigger peak at the port tuning frequency, and then push that tuning frequency down as low as possible. There is of course a trade-off. You sacrifice bass in this region right here, but in exchange for that you get low end extension. A design like this will lower your overall SPL, but you can get that SPL back by throwing more power at it and adding multiple subwoofers. Remember, if you double the cone area, you gain 3 dB of output. And if you double the power, you gain 3 dB more. The other hidden benefit of this alignment is that if you combine it with multiple drivers, it's gonna help you solve what I call the small box problem. As your enclosure gets smaller, your port needs to get longer to maintain the same tuning frequency. But that port takes up airspace. So as the port gets longer, your internal airspace gets smaller, which means you need a longer port, which in turn makes your internal airspace smaller. So by starting with a bigger enclosure and adding multiple drivers, which of course requires a larger box, it's much easier to fit the port in the enclosure. This more traditional design here with a single subwoofer in a quarter cubic foot box tuned to 45 hertz is going to require a 53 inch long vent which is completely absurd plus it can't dig down and hit the lows it loses all of its steam under 40 hertz but if we go with two of these little subwoofers and plug in savard's recommended specifications you get something quite different savard's recommended enclosure with two subwoofers and a lower tuning frequency of 35 hertz can work with a 30 inch port now that's still a challenge to fit inside the enclosure but it's much better than the alternative Plus, you get your low end extension back. That's a lot of technical information, but the big question, does this solve the small subwoofer problem? Now that I've got some hands-on experience with the drivers and how to model them, I think it does. But there's only one way to know for sure. I need to build some boxes and do some side-by-side -side comparisons. I've started the first box. When it gets finished, I'll put a link right up here. In the meantime, click right here to learn more about box design. Before I go, I need to say thank you to all of my patrons with an extra shout out to Sean, David, Fargo, JD America, Baba, Dylan, and Jonathan. I'm Justin. This is the DIY Audio Guy YouTube channel, and I will see you on the next adventure.